गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन इन टूडेज डे टू डे पीडियट्रिक ऑर्थोपेडिक केसेस इन अवर फेलो टीचिंग मॉड्यूल ऑफ ऑर्थोपेड क्लिनिक वी आर हैविंग डॉक्टर डॉक्टर पी एन गुप्ता इज अ प्रोफेसर एट जी एम सी चंदीगढ़ and he sir has a vast experience in deformity corrections as well sir is a uh, very renowned dnb examiners all over the india and at the same time sir have more than 300 publication sir is having a vast experience in deformity correction in both genu vargam genu valvum or upper limb deformity sir have a unique approach to all these cases so it's uh, great to learn uh, this all these approaches uh, from the sir over to you sir thank you thank you chinmay so i think we can start yes sir so i'll be sharing my screen just give me a moment so is my screen visible yes sir so good morning uh, everybody so i'll be speaking about genu veram when to watch when to operate first time when you see a patient of uh, genu veram <coughs> like these are two different scenarios this is a child aged 1 would you operate there is a confusion would you intervene here and this is a girl aged 14 would you intervene here so whether there are differences between these two these two cases or not let's see in the course of the lecture once a child of genu veram comes to you the first thing which comes to your mind is a vitamin d shot okay this is a vitamin d deficiency give vitamin d and then we'll think about something then braces also come to your mind massages and whether surgery is required or not is sometimes a confusion so overview of this talk is what is normal limb alignment and how do you differentiate it from abnormal limb alignment if you see a newborn child the normal alignment at the knee is up between 10 and 15 degrees of varus and this varus is physiological and persists to an average of around 1 and 1/2 years but sometimes it may persist till age of 3 years on an average you will the uh, the child tends to get a straight limb around age of 2 years sometimes at 3 years where the tibio femoral angles are zero and eventually the limb goes into a genu valgum where the valgus is maximum at around 4 years of age around 12 degrees of valgus and the adult values are achieved around 7 to 8 years of age if you see the clinical evaluation the intercondylar distance there on an average goes to zero around age of 2 goes to maximum of valgus that is the intermalleolar distance around 3 to 4 years of age and around 7 to 8 years the adult values will be achieved now we have uh, two timelines one is age less than 2 years where there is a confusion between a physiological genu veram and a abnormal genu veram so i have divided this thing into two scenarios age less than 2 years age more than 2 years so let's see this case of age 1 and 1/2 years there is a confusion whether this is physiological whether this is blounds or this is something else so a lot of confusion is there so best way to take care of that confusion is see the metaphyseal diaphyseal angle and if the metaphyseal diaphyseal angle is more than 11 then you consider the possibility of blounds here it is around 0 so this is not blounds this is a physiological genu veram what happens till age of 2 why there is a varus 
the varus primarily comes from the distal femur where the mean lateral mechanical lateral distal femoral angle which is a line drawn from the center of the head to the center of the femoral condyles and a line along the kissing the distal femoral condyles so this lateral angle on an average is around 95 degrees so usual angle is around 87 of an average in adults so most of the varus comes from the distal femur let's see this case of age 1 year again presenting clinically like a genovir deformity so if you see the patient prone what is happening is the, there is a internal tibial torsion so in an internal tibial torsion can mimic clinically a genu verum so one has to be careful one when in doubt you can take radiographs so summarizing there is common causes up to age 2 in india it is rickets blounds come is not common in india and this second common is post sepsis physical arrest so this is a child with rickets this is obvious with the widening of the metaphysis flaying of the ends and one tends to treat the rickets so what once a deformity of rickets presents to you should you be operating well in a young child what do you do is a metabolic correction and the deformities they tend to obviously with growth yeah so again this is a child aged one and a half years whether this is a physiological genu verum or this is something else so once you take the radiographs the metaphysical diaphysical angle here is 11 degrees so if it is more than 11 11 or more this is indicative of blounds and what do you do in early stages of blounds brace them brace them when do you brace metaphysical diaphysical angle of more than 11 and a obesity with a body mass index of more than 22 degrees these are the cases which are likely to progress further what do you evaluate so basically to summarize this age less than 2 most of the patients will be physiological if you have a doubt take a radiograph it can basically show you two things one is rickets more common second is blounts how do you diagnose blounts by metaphysical diaphysical angle of more than 11 degrees rickets is obvious what do you treat if it is suspected blounts or proven blounts brace it if it is rickets give vitamin d most of the times these deformities they tend to correct spontaneously with age more than 2 years what are the common causes again rickets vitamin d deficiency and hypophosphatemic rickets skeletal dysplasia physical disturbance due to trauma sepsis hereditary multiple exostosis blounds is less common tibial deficiency and focal cartilaginous dysplasia these are less common causes these are more common causes can it be physiological yes it can be physiological but what is not physiological asymmetric deformities are always abnormal wind swept deformities are always abnormal rickets proven rickets with the deformities always abnormal skeletal genu verum and skeletal dysplasia is always abnormal genu verum in associated with short stature or a lateral thrust of the knee is abnormal has to be treated positive family history that this is a child with familial hypophosphatemic rickets this is the mother having same condition 
this is the child having safe condition. This is another child with familial hypophosphatemic rickets. They present with gross deformities, something like an O-shaped deformity. Post-traumatic deformities, either due to malunion or due to growth arrest. Post-infective deformities, unilateral deformities like this. So these are always, they are never physiological. How to evaluate clinically? Intercondylar distance of more than four centimeters, keeping the knee forward position. So if it is more than four centimeters, you consider it as abnormal. And second thing, what you can see is thigh to leg axis, and you can appreciate the Gino Vela. What do you do once you have a genoverum suspected or proven? One is metabolic profile. And if the metabolic profile or vitamin D is deranged, you correct before any intervention. How do you evaluate the deformity radiographically? You take a full length x-ray from the hip till ankle with the knee or patella forward position. And what you evaluate there is the mechanical axis deviation. That means a line passing from the center of the head to the center of the knee, uh, ankle should pass through the center of the knee here. And if there is a deviation, like this line is deviated medially, so this is a medial mechanical axis deviation. This line is deviated laterally, so this is a lateral mechanical axis deviation. Second thing what you see is the magnitude of the deformity and site of angulation or which is called the Cora. So let's go with case example. This is a child aged around 12 with a varus in the left lower limb. So how do you know where the deformity is coming from? To measure the angles the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle here is 87. The joint line convergence angle is 0. The medial proximal tibial angle is 87. So these are within normal range. But if you see the left side, the mechanical lateral distal femoral angle is 110. It is supposed to be 87 on an average. But the proximal tibial angle is normal. The joint line convergence angle is 0 normal. It should be between 0 and 2 degrees. So the varus is coming from the distal femur here. There are some, some misconceptions which I see uh, amongst my residents that volgus is always in the femur and varus is always in the tibia. It is no, not true. Once you diagnose a geno varum, what do you do further? Physiological deformities, you just observe and reassure, but pathological deformities, you have to do something. Why you should do something? If you don't, or if you delay the treatment, the knee joint will go in with a lateral thrust and eventually a degenerative arthritis like this patient. When to treat? as early as possible. This is the case example of a car tire, which is out of alignment. The more you delay the alignment, the more will be the wear and tear. And if you do not uh, treat well in time, this tire, if you don't align this tire well in time, this will be rendered useless. So similarly, if you delay the treatment in the knee, uh, the knee will become arthritic. What are the surgical options here? Gradual correction using growth modulation or using fixators commonly used are elaser of fixators. Acute correction with, with deformity and fixation, either using K-wires, plate and screws, or interlocking nail. Let's see some case examples of this. Growth modulation should be done in home. Minimum of two years of growth remaining should be there. Deformity should usually be less than 30 degrees. 
and the angulation apex or cora should be at or near to the growth plate. So this is one example of a genoverum on the left side treated with the deformity was both in the distal femur as well as the proximal tibia. And this was treated by a guided growth using figure of eight plates. And this you can see uh, in the follow-up that the limb is fully aligned. Guided growth, a word of caution. We have had this very, very frequently that the patients, they do not come for follow-up and end up in a reverse deformity. So patients have to be counseled that these growth modulation plates should be removed at an appropriate time. Otherwise, reverse deformities are, like, are very high possibilities. The, this is a case example of a geno, sorry, this is a geno valgum, but you can get a geno verum also. So this is a case example of geno valgum with a bony bar, and this was treated by a bar oxygen and growth modulation plates. This is a post sepsis physial arrest with the shortening as well. So this was treated by correction of the deformity as well as lengthening using Elizarov apparatus. Another patient with deformity in the tibia treated by gradual distraction using Elizarov. Elizarov has advantages Disadvantages. Advantages are that you can do a multiplanar collection. Limb length discrepancy can be addressed at the same time, can be done at any age. Large corrections are possible. Fine tuning of correction is possible. But the disadvantages are learning curve. And sometimes the patients are not very comfortable with the Elizarov. You can choose to do osteotomy and plate fixation. And this is one child with familial hypophosphatemic rickets where the deformity was corrected using osteotomy and plate fixation. This is an example of osteotomy and plate fixation in the tibia, proximal tibia. The advantages of internal fixation are more comfortable to the patient, rehab is easy and quick. The disadvantages are the large corrections are difficult. Fine tuning is not possible. Was what, whatever correction you have done on table stays. And second surgery is required for hardware removal, especially in children. You can consider osteotomy and nail fixation, especially in familial hypophosphatemic rickets where the deformities are multi-apical. That means there are more than two coras. So this is one child aged around 13 treated with correction of the deformity using osteotomy at two places and fixation with a nail. Uh, this is a case example of combination where the deformity in the distal femur was corrected using the plate and the deformity in the proximal tibia was corrected using a Elizarov fixator. So to summarize, one should know about the natural history of limb alignment. Avoid unnecessary surgery or bracing. One should remember that most adult values are achieved by the age of seven. Anything intercondylar distance more than four is not physiological and, and requires further evaluation. Any deformity, actual deformity should be identified and treated early. And these are some of the articles and books for further reading. I thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful talk. There are some questions in our chat box. Yeah. Uh, first question from Dr. Maulin Shah, sir. How intracondylar distance measurement is reliable with increasing height and uh, height to length, uh, length of the child? See, intracondylar distance is not diagnostic of a genoverum. It is only suspected of a genoverum deformity. 
so if you have a doubt that the intercondylar distance is more than 4 then you consider genoverum in those cases if you it is not a diagnostic uh, thing with the uh, uh, intercondylar distance and the intercondylar distance could vary with the position of the limb so the best way is uh, with the patella forwards or knee forwards position okay sir then again uh, what sort of uh, osteotomy you prefer in case of uh, hypophosphatidic rickets sir so basically the osteotomy is dictated by the cora so if you have a cora near to the uh, growth plate you can only do a plate fixation but in hypophosphatemic rickets lot of times it is a o shaped deformity o shaped deformity so o shaped deformities are i mean there are lot of these uh, kids they present nearing skeletal maturity and that gives you an opportunity to use a nail using multiple osteotomies using the anatomical axis as your alignment guide but having said that you can choose to use a plate or a laser or whatever is your choice Okay, sir. So you do multiple closing wedge osteotomies? Yeah, lateral closing wedge in hypophosphatic yeah. rickets. Usually two osteotomies are uh, uh, required in yeah. a lot of cases, yes. And, yeah. and, uh, and you must be using either tibia or the humerus interval of male for femur because the length is short in the yeah. patients, right? I mean, uh, uh, whatever I have done as osteotomies, uh, I mean, all these children were, were with the growth plates closed. They came at a later uh, time after right. until maturity. So, uh, I mean, I use the standard interlocking nail. Okay. Yes, a lot of these the children are using, lot yeah, of so, numerous. Yeah. So, one has to be careful to arrange smaller length nails as well. And in very small kids, one can use the numerous <laughs> interlock nail as well. Yeah, you uh, uh, honestly, I don't have experience with humerus interlock nail in uh, femur. I have, we have but used uh, more, whatever is your choice. We have used it in also in fibrous. In, uh, one more thing which I wish to add here is that in hypophosphatemic rickets, the healing is, usually, uh, is usually delayed. I mean, it takes a much longer time to heal the osteotomy than in a non hypophosphatemic rickets cases. So this scenario has to be factored in. And one case where I did a Elizara took around six or seven months to unite and the patient was not happy with the Elizara in the fever. Right. This has to be factored in. I mean, most of these uh, children will take a longer time to unite. Okay, sir. Yes, and, yes, sir. Then, then there is a one more question from Dr. Gauru, sir. Is, is unilateral virus always pathological? Have you seen unilateral virus with vitamin D deficiency correcting with vitamin D supplements only? See, unilateral virus, if it is present, you almost always think of some abnormality somewhere. So, technically, it is possible to have with rickets unilateral virus, but you should evaluate that. I mean, I will not uh, sort of just observe without evaluation in a unilateral virus. Okay, sir. Then, then, then there is one more question. Could uh, could see only two rings in your Elizaro cases? Did you uh, see any instability issue? Uh, in Elizaro, basically, what you do is span far, far, and near near cortices, and I tend to use. Uh, Rancho cubes with the uh, tapered half pins placed away also. So if you if you take care of eight cortices in in uh, Elizarov, whether using one ring or two rings, two rings you can use two two Elizarov wires on each ring. One ring you can use two Elizarov wires and two uh, tapered half pins. So that makes it eight cortices. So if you use eight cortices. Uh, there is no problem. I have never faced a problem of instability. 
Okay, sir. Uh, what classical teaching remains two rings per segment. Yes. Okay. Sir. So, what is your experience of growth modulation in adolescent with tibia vara? Adolescents, yes, no, I have, I have no experience. Honestly, the the blounts is not common in uh, North India. So I have, I mean, uh, mine is a very uh, busy uh, pediatric orthopedic clinic. So till now, I have seen, I think, only two cases. That was infantile tibia vera. Adult, I mean, uh, adolescent tibia vera, I have never seen in North India. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, so I think, but I think in adolescents, what is important to factor in is that there should be sufficient growth remaining. Adolescents do not have a sufficient growth remaining. So as a matter of principle, you do not consider a growth modulation unless the deformity is so small that you expect it to correct by that time. Okay. Uh, so that's all the question we have right now. And I'll ask Dr. Deepak sir to share his screen for cases. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, just uh, one more thing which I wish to add is I have added uh, some of the further reading and this first article is written by us which gives a broad overview of to the basically to the residents what is physiological it is concerning both Genu Viram and Valgum and what is pathological and when do you treat and when do you intervene and when do you don't. Okay, please. We will <clears throat> this article uh, will be shared on this fellows group by Chinmay, so all everyone can. Free of cost. This is available. This is in yeah. Journal of Clinical Orthopedics and Trauma. It's yeah, available yeah, yeah. online. So Chinmay, we should uh, refer this on the uh, fellows. Yes. Group, okay. Yes. Sir. So yeah, the, so yeah, the present. Uh, shall I start, sir? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, I'll be presenting a case of 14 year old boy presented with a progressive deformity of the right knee. So, uh, these were the clinical picture. And uh, as you can clearly see, there is a significant varus, there is a recurvatum in the knee. So, uh, unfortunate, sorry. So, unfortunately, what happened in 2015 when the child was six, seven years old, he had a tibia fracture for which uh, tense nail was done. Bilateral tense nail was done. Two tense nails were inserted from proximal to distal. And uh, that proximal side as per parent got infected. And because of that infection, mm -hmm. uh, there was a gross uh, physical damage and it led to this deformity. And, uh, and at the time of presentation, this was the gate of the child. So, you can see there is a significant limb length discrepancy along with this deformity. Because the most important part is he is having a, a significant lateral thrust. So, uh, is there any comments? What is the cause of uh, this lateral thrust at knee? So, this is uh, due to a prolonged varus deformity. And a prolonged varus deformity at the knee will the, eventually the lateral structures are going to give way and lead to a lateral thrust. So, lateral thrust indicates instability and this is a little urgency to treat. If you don't treat a child with lateral thrust, they progress very rapidly to degenerative arthritis. So, uh, in my experience, in addition to the laxity of the structures, the oblique joint line is also a very important cause along with the changes in the tibial slope to so this lateral thrusting in the joints whenever uh, they are presenting with a varus deformity. So, uh, at when the child presented to me, I uh, got this scanogram. So, uh, on scanogram, we did, we did a malalignment test and on malalignment test, yes, you can see the mechanical axis passing through varus. But on uh, doing segmental malalignment, so we were able to identify that that mechanical LDFA was 80 and uh, MPTA was 67, which indicated that in addition to that proximal tibial varus, the distal femur was also having some compensatory valgus due to which the joint line was oblique and this oblique joint line was contributing to this uh, valgus, this lateral thrust. So, on a closer evaluation of this x-ray, 
a proper uh, ap view was taken by tilting the beam so as to get a proper joint line of proximal tibia to taken care of that uh, reverse slope we can identify this yes, there is a proximal tibial varus there is a reverse tibial slope and the distal femur was in valgus so now what is the plan for the correction in such cases whether we should go for an acute or uh, one stage or two stage correction or whether it is an actual uh, acute or a gradual correction so sir what will be your, your plan in this case can we go back yes yeah so uh, the the distal femur uh, valgus is about 7 degrees i that's what i think it is sorry sir how much is the distal femur valgus is it 7 degrees uh, or sir distal femur uh, mechanical ldf is 80 degrees, degrees so uh, as compared to the opposite side it is contributing around 7 degrees of valgus yeah. so 7 degrees the age of the child is 14 14 yes sir so 14 is the borderline age where you mm -hmm. are you are little uh, uh, confused between whether to do a growth modulation or do a corrective osteotomy mm -hmm. here i would uh, uh, consider a elbow x ray or mm -hmm. i mean if you have a clinical picture if there are secondary sex characters appearing then the mm -hmm. likelihood of this distal fever deformity correcting with growth modulation would reduce so in that case i will consider a valgus oh, sorry distal femur varus otherwise i'll consider a growth modulation for distal femur valgus for and the so what for the tibia my choice would be elizer and i think if i mean on gross evaluation the femur appears to be a bit longer i don't know i mean you must have measured it yes. so i have seen in some of these children that the femur compensates for the shortening sometimes so you you do a limb length uh, correction you do a slope correction and you do a valgus uh, i mean the varus correction at the same time using the laser yes. so uh, deepak if i can add one point yes sir i would also like to uh, correct it with an elizer but you can see the tibia is short and fibula is overriding yeah yes so you may avoid fibular osteotomy in first go uh, mm -hmm. correct and lengthen tibia and once the fibula station comes to the normal position compared to the opposite side then you can add fibular osteotomy and you can fix yes. with a transfixing wire and then wire. lengthen both tibia and fibula you know Yes. So, so uh, otherwise, there is a hmm. issue related to that. What can happen is if uh, we are correcting the deformity first, and we are not doing the fibular osteotomy, it might not allow, or it may subluxate the joint. So, uh, what I did in this case was uh, I did the fibular osteotomy, corrected the uh, deformity, and then I removed that uh, wire which was transfixing the fibula at the time of lengthening. So the, by the time the lengthening was done, the fibula came to station. So, so my plan okay. was a single stage gradual correction of proximal tibia with a biplanar elizero fixator with growth modulation of distal femur to correct the valgus. So uh, planning according to a biplanar deformity was done. You can see there is a 20 degree varus and 34 degrees of recurvatum. So this was an oblique plane deformity of 39 degrees. So mm. since the fora in both the cases was very articular. and uh, the osteotomy plan was distal to tibial tuberosity as we are planning lengthening as well so osteotomy rule 2 was used so uh, to start with a medial distal femur growth plate modulation was done with eight plate and a prefabricated uh, three ring elizero frame according to uh, pre op oblique plane planning was done and was mounted and fixed you can see on the uh, cm image on the right uh, this is an oblique plane x ray which is showing the hinge hinges are perfectly overlapped and the maximum deformity can be seen exactly this is the immediate post op ap and lateral you can appreciate uh, the rings are in some varus and recurvatum but the important in these cases is to get an oblique plane x ray like this so uh, in this these are the x rays in plane of the deformity hinges are overlapped and maximum deformity is visible 
so we calculate the distraction speed on the basis of law of equilateral triangles and according to that we start the distraction this is as soon as distraction was started deformity started correcting this is the follow up you can appreciate the oblique x ray getting corrected this is at the time when the full deformity was corrected and the uh, uh, this is the follow up scanogram in this scanogram you can see after partial correction of deformity mechanical x ray is now shifting laterally and it is lateral to the lateral tibial spine still some tibial correction is remaining so after full deformity correction in both the planes hinges were replaced with a straight rod and that wire that was transfixing the fibula was removed and the distraction was continued to gain the length this is after full deformity correction now we can appreciate the yes there is an the valgus which was there in distal femur is now visible this was the distraction was stopped and limb length was equal this was at the consolidation phase this was before implant removal the scanogram uh, before x fix showing uh, the mechanical axis passing almost zone 2 with limb length equal so this was at implant removal full consolidation the slope was corrected the varus was corrected the fibula is got at station now this is a follow up scanogram uh, mechanical axis now it's coming up to neutral the eight plate screws are diverging and joint line is less oblique This is the uh, six-month follow-up uh, photograph of the clinical picture of the child. This is at 18 months. This is at six-month uh, walking video. We can appreciate there is some lateral thrust going because of that remaining oblique obliquity of the joint, which will correct with time uh, with growth modulation. And uh, this is at latest. with almost full correction done with no complaints and the child is walking without any limb discrepancy and without any thrusting so uh, lateral thrust great is contributed mostly by joint line obliquity and reverse tibial slope we should always keep in mind about the compensatory valgus at the distal femur in case of tibia vara can't correct deformity vice versa like tibial deformity into femur and femur deformity into tibia and a precise pre operative planning is needed when dealing with an oblique strain deform mm -hmm. that's a nice case uh, deepak Practice. nicely executed and uh, yeah so sunny wants a final scanogram yeah now this child uh, When, when did you stop lengthening? Did you factorize the remaining growth from the opposite so, uh, tibia? Yeah, so it's almost because like uh, elbow. Yeah. Because elbow is elbow was fusing. The, very yes. So I didn't try Doctor. to make him more over length because uh, when he went into the slim, it's looking like more <laughs> longer. Longer so than the other. So at that time, yeah. yes. So at that time, I stopped and. Uh, and now at present i'm waiting for his latest scanogram so that we can evaluate uh, if the axes are aligned then we can remove that weight mm -hmm. okay yes goro has some comment x rather than eight plate yeah that is right x would uh, x is shown and quick correction quicker correction than eight plate in adolescence that's right but Definitely yeah, from last uh, six seven months, sir. I have uh, I'm doing that uh, from last six seven months, and I'm getting good results out of it. But uh, initially, I was more prone for uh, eight plates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe when you started uh, this case, uh, pets were not that popular for you. Yes, yes. yes. I think uh, okay, let, let's move on to the next uh, case. Two epiphyseal diseases should be done more towards the end of uh, when the patient is nearing skeletal maturity. in a younger child i think the figure of eight plates the chances of uh, uh, permanent growth rest so deepak can you unshare your screen yes sir yeah so that um, yeah dr joins yeah, you please share screen <laughs> to the advanced in start Okay. 
good morning i'll be presenting a case of tibia vera in a uh, child with a focal fibrocartilage in its defect so this 3 month old boy he was brought uh, and the, the parents had noticed bowing of legs and an abnormal gait pattern this is how he came to our opd mm, uh so he presented with a waddling gait with a left lateral thrust and a gdu and the hips and spine were normal this was the initial x ray with which he presented at 16 months and uh and we repeated the x ray after 7 months this is his follow up x ray we initially decided to wait on the child and we noticed of a worsening of the deformity so will we so for the weight on the uh, so dr gupta uh, what is your protocol of treating uh, tibia vara with uh, ffcd when you watch and when you intervene so in this particular case there is a severe tibial weakness uh, and this is likely to progress so mm -hmm. i would uh, go into the figure of it plate here right so the <clears throat> i have seen similar a uh, couple of ffcds which have uh, improved uh, over time that is focal fibrocartilaginous uh, defect or uh, joint switch says some literature uh, and there are some patients who uh, which have improved we have braced uh, we also braced this child Uh, because as unilateral genuvirum is probably only indication of three point bracing but uh, unlike other cases this child kept on worsening the mechanical axis kept on deviating more medially now joins so, so focal fibrocartilage defect was uh, first reported by bell coal from the royal children's hospital in melbourne they presented a three series a case series of three patients with an average age of presentation of 14 months and two out of these children they corrected with osteotomy and one resolved spontaneously and since then there have been lot of case uh, reports and case series of uh, ffcds and in 2017 uh, wellborn and stevens they Uh, suggested using guided growth for treatment of these patients so they uh, have reported three patients with an average age of presentation of 14 months and they used eight plates on these children and they achieved good correction with which required no further interventions and they uh, saw no recurrence so this is what we planned and executed for this child and this is the one year follow up this is a two year follow up of the same child this is the clinical correction at 2 years post op so great case i think with a good learning lesson on that the uh, this uh, ffcd cases are little uh, it take little longer to correct compared to the uh, other tibia vara probably because of uh, uh because of the tether on the medial side and in the course of treatment uh, the eight plates span completely and we had to re, uh, re uh, position the screws of the eight plates so this child required two interventions so uh, dr khatri we we operated i think at the age of 2 uh, 2 uh, years and 3 months and then we had to change the position so probably around 3 three, three and 3 uh, years and 3 months and then at 4 and 1/2 it got corrected we would not intervene if the deformity is correcting but on some consecutive three observations we found that uh, mechanical axis is progressing medially even though child is wearing the brace very compliantly and that's why we we intervene Uh, sir, should I start the case? Sir? Sure, please. 
Yes, sir. So today, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we are going to present an unusual complication which occurred after growth modulation. So we had a child who presented at the age of five years. Uh, at then she presented with complaints of shortening of the right lower limb, equinus at the ankle and significant valgus at the ankle. And she had some valgus at the knee as well. But these are not uh, uh, pictures representing the actual valgus at the knee. She had this deformity since birth and she did not undergo any intervention till then. And she presented only at the age of five years. Uh, here we can see that the tibial component, there is significant shortening. The radiographs uh, reveal that the right lower limb was shorter by five centimeters with four centimeters of shortening by the tibia and one centimeter from the femur. She had knee and ankle valgus deformity, though the ankle valgus was sig uh, significant. And she had fibular hemimelia, type 1B, acumen, and calamshi. Knee valgus was contributed because of the femur, and the LDFA was 81 degrees, the mechanical LDFA. So these were her radiographs. The preoperative radiographs are not available, missing. And uh, this was post uh, growth modulation. So we have done growth modulation initially at this age to correct the knee valgus as part of stage one. And the stage two was for, uh, planned to lengthen the tibia accordingly. But the child was lost to fall up post-growth modulation in spite of explaining them very well that she has to return for removal of the eight plate. And she presented so, at the age... Yes. So, Goda, this was, um, this was a COVID era. Yes, a patient sir, sir. from a remote place in Rajasthan. Sir. And they could not come back because of this. And she, they, she presented after, I think, three, four years. Five, yes, sir. Five yeah. years, sir. Yeah, Malin, uh, I have seen this quite frequently in my center that uh, despite telling them repeatedly, especially the patients who may not be from a very rich uh, socioeconomic status, sometimes they tend mm -hmm. to ignore the... So there is a paper published in Journal of Pediatric Orthopedics that when uh, which sort of patients they uh, default in follow up, and they there are two factors. One is a patient from other province, and second, when the native language of doctor and patient is different, then there are high chances that they would default. So even though you explain in great details in their language, uh, so th that was an interesting paper. They have seen this. Yeah. So, Malin, uh, what I have observed is that uh, this is a paper maybe from one of the Western countries. Yeah. Uh, in my center, I mean, a lot of children who are even from nearby. I mean, especially the ones where they are not from very well-to-do socioeconomic status. A lot of them, they default on the... Yeah, yeah, that's right. So economic constraints. Yeah. Are yeah. So maybe some economic constraints, and then of course during the COVID era, we saw a lot of uh, children going going the other way around. Today only I have kept a case in the OT where uh, Gino Valgum ended up in a Gino Vera. So my resident is doing that. Yeah. So, so she presented five years later with significant uh, virus, knee virus, and this is her gait. She had significant lateral thrust as well, and there was shortening of about 10 centimeters now with five centimeters from the femoral component and the remaining from the tibia. So how do we manage this case, sir? These are her radiographs. And her LDFA now is around uh, 130 degrees and the deformity is around 43 degrees in the femur, about 5 centimeter shortening in the femur and, and the remaining 5.5 from the tibia. So, and with a broken screw and a broken implant. So, how do we manage it now? So? See, basically, if the child defaults once, it is likely that the child will default again. Highly likely. So, such like cases, unless they are very close to the end of growth, I will not like to repeat the procedure because of social reasons. So, I will remove this hardware, consider a correction of the deformity and lengthening in the femur 
and same thing in the tibia. But having said that, one has to ensure that there is no instability at the knee. Otherwise, the child goes in for a pre-lengthening reconstruction of the knee. Ligamentous instability. So, so what we did in this case is uh, we have done bilateral <laughs> distal thema and proximal tibia drill epiphysiodesis. Then we we went ahead and uh, planned for a knee spanning Elizaro external fixator. And uh, the CODA was uh, calculated, the osteotomy site was calculated, and we have done a rule to osteotomy to correct the deformity. So this is post uh, correction. Here we have taken uh, uh, a lengthening hinge, that is the axis of correction, Aka was taken away from the bone that is on the line of Cora to attain some, achieve some lengthening as well. This is a pre, uh, post corticotomy, post surgery, the post op x ray, and this is post operative day two. The child is, was quite comfortable. And we went ahead and uh, distracted it uh, based on the calculations of rule of equilateral triangles and the uh, uh, though there was some amount of translation which was expected in osteotomy rule too, we attained good correction as well as a uh, good region rate. Uh, and this is her the clinical pictures post, this is pre-op and this is post correction. And we are awaiting consolidation for fixator removal. Uh, we have planned the fixator removal next month and the residual lengthening of about 5.5 centimeters and the angle issues are planned to be corrected later in the stage two surgery. Thank you, sir. So great case, great learning. Yeah, so main issue is uh, the question whether we should, uh, we have to be very careful and we have to keep on explaining the families about the need of coming back uh, uh, for follow-up. The simple genuvalgum deformity ended up into a gross uh, uh, genuvarum and it uh, increased the amount of intervention for this child. You know. So I think and the best is to tell the child, tell the parents that this deformity, if you don't come in time for a follow-up, this is likely to end up in more problems. So... I mean, maybe perhaps this is one way. So just it. like uh, uh, fracture uh, remodeling atlas, we should also make an atlas of uh, growth modulation failure to yes. come back. So I have, have uh, I have had a couple of cases. I think I'll just see. Yeah, I, I also have this valgum getting into varus, and then yeah. I have to replace the eight plate and uh, the medial side, and they get corrected. So. Fine. So that was a great session. Chinma, you can conclude. Thanks, Guptaji, for your time. And, uh, learning. Thanks, yeah. uh, Deepak. It was a great case. Thank you so much, sir. That's a nice case discussion and nice overview of a Jenu Varam, and which was followed by a nice case presentation with everyone and yeah, how to read all these conditions. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.